to those of you who experience that in your life, um, I, I do humbly say I'm so very, very sorry. But there is a Heavenly Father who longs to love you with a undeniable and limitless love. He is willing to accept you as you are and where you are and for what you have been. And he's ready to give you a new name, his name. And he's ready to give you an unconditional love. And so um, on this Father's Day, if you don't have good memories of your dad, or if maybe you just don't have memories at all of your dad because he wasn't there, um, then may I recommend and encourage you to look at a heavenly father who loves you unconditionally. We're glad you're here today. We're also going to be honoring our graduates during our service today. So if you are a high school graduate, you are in our service, we have a gift for you, and uh, we'll be calling you up in a little while. We're also going to look at pictures from you when you were a baby in an elementary school and uh, on your graduation day. So we'll be looking at that in just a few minutes, but we're so glad you were here. If you're a guest here today, you honor us by your presence. Thank you for coming know what it is that brought you here today, but we are glad that you chose to be with us. Uh, on the back of the pew, there are some communication cards, and we'd love for you to take one, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by. Um, here's the promise we make to you. We are not going to come knock on your door. We are not going to call you on the phone, but we will send you through the mail information that tells you about the church, our staff, what we believe, and when our services are. Hopefully answer most of your questions, and we hope that today we don't scare you away so you'll never come see us again, but we hope you'll want to know what goes on around there on a regular basis, and we're happy to get that information into your hands. Those uh, bits of information are also there. Those cards are there for you who attend regularly. If you have messages to the staff, prayer requests, updates on prayer requests, praise items, appointments, please indicate that on the card. Drop it in the offering bag. And every Tuesday as a staff, we sit down and go through each of those cards. Before I draw your attention to the big screen and our morning announcements, I'm going to get the clipboards going around. There's uh, just one item on here. And uh, that is, we've had a, a ministry around here called Helping Hands Ministry for the last few years. There is a large freezer over in our office building, and that freezer was put there for one purpose, and that is to put frozen food in. Uh, <laughs> imagine that, a freezer for frozen foods. But what it's designed to do is to be uh, fresh, you know, homemade food that you've made so that when there is a need in our church, somebody just had a baby and a mom doesn't really need to cook for a couple of days and dad can't cook. <laughs> uh, and so we can provide them a couple of meals, all right, uh, for events like, uh, unfortunate events like we had this past week, um, where we could provide uh, food for the best and for Stephen. Um, and it made life a little bit easier on a couple of those evenings. And so members of our staff deliver those uh, when there is a need like that. Well, the cupboard is bare, all right, and so um, we thought instead of just reaching out to our same list, we would give folks an opportunity. If you would like to be part of Helping Hands Ministry, and what they'll do is they'll send you an email or reach out to you only every, you know, three, four, six months when the cupboard gets bare, and if you can prepare, you know, something like lasagna, a casserole dish, something that, you know, you're, you're really good at. <laughs> and may I just say, thank you. For all the wonderful desserts this past week that you made for the memorial reception, all right? Uh, number one, we had plenty of desserts, all right? 68 of you stepped to the plate, and you took care of about 300 people at the reception, um, and they were really, really... Uh, they were, the, the guys from Pardini's were carrying them out when they would start to get low, and before they could get to the table, people were taking it out of their hands, all right? So thank you so much for all that you did. And so... Um, uh, th this is a way in which you can help, and yet you don't have to come in contact really with another person. And sometimes I know that's scary, but you make a meal, you freeze it, you bring it here, we put it in our freezer. Please indicate, on, well, actually, somebody will call you and tell you what the guidelines are for this, all right? Uh, all we need to, and if you've signed up in the past, go ahead and sign up again. We want to freshen up our list, all right? And that is the only, um, only clipboard that's going around. May I draw your attention to the screen as we look at our morning announcements, please? Different and change is what happens when we unleash the Holy Spirit within us. I'm Dan Mueller of the Elder Board. Let's allow God to use us to make a difference. We're glad you are here. Enjoy the service. 
New Hope Families Ministry has a couple of fun events this summer. The first is Water Night, and it's on July 3rd at 5.30. We have water slides, a giant slip and slide, food, snow cones, splash pool for the little ones, and even a snowball fight in July. So come along and join us on July 3rd. The second event is our annual Vacation Bible School. This will be July 15th through the 18th, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. The Mr. J Band is back, and this year their program is There's a Monster Under My Bed. This is all about Jesus being the light. This group connects with the elementary school kids really well. They do it through games, songs, Bible studies. There'll even be fun crafts and snacks for the kids. There's no cost for this event, and it's open to pre-K through sixth grade. So that's July 15th through the 18th. We'll also be looking for volunteers for this event. So look for the sign-up sheets that'll be going around soon. We need lots of volunteers to help our kids have the best time they can and learn a lot. Howdy, New Hope. Come a run into our Build the Barn fundraiser on September 15th. We will have live music and a free barbecue with all the fixings. We will have a country store with silent auction and a live auction with our very own Pastor Tim. Mosey on over because everyone will be there. Invite your friends. Happy, Happy trails. trails. A little bit more about the barn event coming up in September. We just want you to get it on your calendar and save the date. The beautiful thing is it's free, all right? Uh, but we'll tell you more about its purpose and intent next week. It is to raise funds for the barn. And uh, we'll give you some updates next week about that project. Um, the events of this past week is one more evidence we need to get the barn built, all right? Uh, we could have saved the family a considerable amount of money not having to rent the Clovis Veterans Memorial Building. But because we don't have a facility large enough, uh, we don't have a lot of options. And so uh, please know there's another reason why we need to get that done. All right, we're going to take a couple of minutes and recognize our high school and college graduates. Uh, we've got about uh, 14 or 15 high schoolers who have graduated from high school in the last couple of weeks. We have six that we know of, college graduates. Uh, and uh, we understand most of them aren't going to be in this service, though there may be a couple. Most that will be here will be in the next service because that's their regular time they usually come. And we know that a vast majority of them aren't in church at all today, but for a very good reason. They got a job at Hume Lake Christian Camp, and they're already up there working, all right? How many, did we end up with 13, I think, high school and college students from our church that are employed at Hume Lake Christian Camp this summer? So we are very, very grateful for that. So I'm going to call out their names. If, if you happen to be here, would you come on up? These are the ones I know about. Colby Jackson from Sanger High, Jalen Silifon from Sanger High, Jordan Selway from Clovis West, Madison Castle is here. I know that, from Clovis West, Paul DeBar from Clovis East, Matthew Hutchinson from Clovis East, Keanu Burleson from Clovis East, Brianna Pierce from Buchanan High School, Noah Martin from Clovis North, Joshua Champion from Clovis High, Madison Taylor, Buchanan High School, Madison Mueller, Clovis North, Madison Venuto from uh, Clovis West through Independent Study, and Akira Cathcart from Clovis West. Any of you here, come on up. All right, Madison, come on up. Keanu is here. All right, come on up. Good, good, good. All right. Congratulations. All right, good job. Way to go. Now, let me tell you what, uh, what these two are going to do. All right, Madison Castle, I understand you are leaving for the United States Army. Is that correct? All right. And when are you leaving? July 14th. July 14th. So just in a few weeks. Did you meet the height requirement for the United States Army? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're excited. We're going to be praying for you, all right? And you will have folks from here writing to you while you're gone, all right? So we'll be excited for those updates. And Keanu, uh, do you know what you're going to be doing next? Yeah, I'm going to start, I start my job Monday. Start your job Monday? Does this have to do with welding? No, I'm going to be uh, learning how to be a contractor. Learn how to be a contractor. Great job. Can you get that in time for our barn building? It's about two months, all right? We hope to be going on that. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. I have a gift for each of you.
This is a daily devotional book. It's for you to read one page every day for 365 days in a row, all right? It is what I believe to be the absolute best daily devotional book there is. It takes you deep into God's Word, but in small snippets, and if you will put that into practice, your life will be in much better shape 10 years from now than it is today. God bless you. Thank you for your success. All right. Now... Anybody else here that you, even if you're a guest today, but you graduated from high school this week, we would, we have a gift for you as well. Okay, you graduated from high school? All right. Let me highlight those graduating from college. Uh, Kareen Tatikian graduated from Fresno State. Alexa Bell from Fresno State. Tara Ventura from Fresno Pacific. Ashley Sanchez with her master's degree from... Alliant, all right. Uh, Katie Gerald with her master's degree from in Texas. Baylor, thank you very much. And Kim Self, all right. Kim is slightly older than the rest of this group, all right. Uh, received her master's degree, and she works at Fresno Pacific. I'm guessing that's where she also got her master's degree from. Are any of you here today? I know four of them aren't, but two I'm not sure. All right, anybody else graduating from college and we didn't know about it? We have a gift for you. I want to say thank you so much for um, all of your help this past week uh, as you prepared food for uh, a reception, uh, as you prayed for Stephen and for his family. Uh, as you showed up, there were, uh, there were well over 65 from New Hope who were at the memorial service. They were about 650 who attended to uh, honor Augustina. And uh, we are so grateful for all the support you've shown in so many different ways. Um, one of the areas in which New Hope showed support was also through its small group ministry. Um, I know small groups are hard. I know they're messy sometimes. Uh, uh, not, not every small group works out for you, but I want to challenge you. Uh, if you can, find a way to, to plug into a small group. Corey's going to be out at a table between the services today. She'll be happy to answer some questions, take information. But um, l- let me give you an illustration of how small group helped this week. In our 8 o'clock service, there's one of our small groups that sits at a round table. They all sit together every Sunday. They don't get tired of meeting every week, and then they sit together on Sunday. Except they don't let the Bethel sit with them at church on Sunday mornings. I don't know why. They have to sit at another table. But they're still part of that small group. And um, that small group surrounded the Bethels this week, and that's Stephen's mom, all right, and, and her husband. And they, they made numerous calls. They provided some financial resource where it was necessary with, with expenses. They provided food. Uh, they were there at the service. Their presence during that challenging time made a huge difference. When you're part of a church that has three services, we don't get the privilege of getting acquainted with each other on a, on a very deep level. And so where that makes a difference is through small group. I think maybe one of the more powerful points that I was able to make in the message on Thursday came from a small group that Augustina and Stephen were a part of that John Realhorn sent to me who led a small group that they were in about how Stephen had just led a Bible study a few months ago You don't see Stephen as a Bible study leader, but in their small group, they each took a turn. They got to choose their own lesson, and Stephen chose Romans chapter 5, and they said he did an outstanding job in his preparation, hosting it in his own home, and then delivering the lesson. And if you're not familiar with Romans chapter 5, it talks about the joy that can be ours through the process of pain and suffering. That was just a couple of months ago. And so God has a way of taking these all things and he uses them in our lives for for our best in difficult circumstances. And so small groups are a vital, important part of of who we are. And I would encourage you, um, I know it's messy, I know sometimes it's difficult, but the rewards are worth the effort there. So encourage you to talk with her uh, afterwards today. 
Let me highlight just a couple of prayer requests that are not in your bulletin. Rick Kelly had to have bypass surgery this past Monday. Went in for an angiogram. It went from stents to bypass surgery. So be praying for him as he recovers. Jenny Hale, who works our computer back there, she'll find out tomorrow when she's going to have gallbladder surgery. Bernie from our 8 o'clock service, he's already been treated for esophageal cancer. Uh, he's got barium's back, all right, in it. So he's going to go back to Stanford for another treatment up there. So please be remembering him. Stephen Dean from our church had uh, lesions on the brain that were creating all kinds of problems. They went in and did surgery. Uh, He is better, but he's also worse. The worst part is he can't walk with one of his legs right now. So he'll be going to rehab, getting some additional recovery there. So please be praying for them. Helen Heath uh, has been diagnosed with some things that they're going to be giving her next steps with. So be praying for her as she goes through that. And then tomorrow, Uh, Right here in the morning, we have a memorial service for Hubert Weisner. Uh, Just did his nephew's service about three weeks ago. So this is the second time for this family in less than a month. So we appreciate you remembering the Weisner family. So that about wraps up our... Uh, our prayer request for the day. I'm going to ask our ushers to come wait on us as uh, we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? And then the worship team will be back out to engage us in our worship. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I'm so grateful for who you are and what you promise to provide for us in life. You're very straightforward and you're very honest with us. You tell us in this world we'll have challenges We'll have difficulties. You tell us we'll even go through the process of grief, yet there are none of the troubles that we will go through that we will do so alone. You tell us you'll be with us and we don't have to be afraid. You tell us when we grieve that your comfort is deeper than our grief. And so, Father, we're going to trust those promises today. We've seen your work and your activity in this past week, and it's a reminder that you keep your word. Father, today it's a... It's, it's, it's almost, for me, it feels like it's a day that I'm going to take a breath. I almost feel like this past week I've been holding my breath. And so, Father, today as we, as we breathe, uh, I trust that we breathe spiritually and mentally and emotionally. And while we do, we, we breathe in your promises. And, Father, we exhale our frustrations. We breathe in your comfort And we exhale our pain. We breathe in your strength. And we exhale our weaknesses. Father, I I pray for ongoing leadership in our lives, for how you best want to use us here at New Hope to be of help to Stephen, to his family, to his friends. We, We want New Hope to be a place, Father, where... Pain and frustration is not an embarrassment to ask for help. We want to be a place where, Father, we recognize sometimes we fail, but, Father, we, we, we want those failures to not be intentional or to be out of ignorance. Father, I, uh, I'm grateful this is Father's Day. I'm grateful for the, some reason at some point in time in the history of this nation, um, people set aside two days for us to remember significant people in our lives, our moms and our dads. Today, uh, Father, we recognize, we recognize the men who are our fathers. For some, it's not been their birth dad, but it's been adoptive dads. For others, it's not even been adoptive's dad. It's been another man who stood in the gap to provide what uh, either a dad couldn't or wasn't there to do. And so may we express our gratitude to them today. Father, as dads, I pray that um, the Scripture says that that one of our responsibilities is to provide spiritual leadership to our families. My dad is almost 94 years old, and he continues to provide spiritual leadership for his family. I pray, Lord, that the rest of us will continue to do so as well. Father, on this day, which is Father's Day, and it's easy to talk about hunting and fishing and mountains and football games and hobbies, but Father, I pray that somehow we'll find the time to talk about faith in Jesus Christ. Father, sometimes when our children are grown, 
I, I guess we even do it when our children are at home, that somehow as parents we, we want to be their friends instead of their parents. We don't say anything about spiritual needs. We're just assuming that they're old enough to figure it out for themselves. But Father, I pray you'll give us the courage to be able to say what you would want us to say to our kids who may not be walking with you. Father, sometimes we, we sacrifice the benefits. God, I'm not even sure how to say it. Sometimes we're not willing to be awkward because we want to keep things comfortable. But Father, I can't think of anything more uncomfortable than not knowing we have eternity with our kids. And so I pray that for all of us as parents, you, you give us the will and the wisdom to know how to articulate our love for you and, and your love for our family and, and our friends and the people that you bring into our world to have influence. I pray, Lord, we can have those conversations. I commit this day and all that you want to speak to us. May we have a willingness to listen and, and Father, a readiness to obey your leadership in our lives. I trust you for this and so much more. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, I called Tim this week and let him know what's been going on around our community. And I told them I was in need of worship today. And you guys brought it, so thank you. Um, see, what we, what we sung about was not that we are happy with the circumstances that we're living in. But what we were singing about was the confidence we can have in the one who is bigger than our circumstances. And uh, there are times that the circumstances overwhelm us. And we need to be reminded of the promises and the faithfulness of a God who loves us. Whether those circumstances were prompted by our own foolish mistakes whether those circumstances were prompted by bad judgment, whether those circumstances were the results of others in our life. Sometimes the evil one does a great job of clouding our vision and putting brain lesions in our heart so that we forget the truth of who God is. And if it wasn't for the truth of who God is and what God has done for us, then these overwhelming circumstances would mount up and mount up and mount up, and we would all be destroyed. And so, this was good today. It was good for me, anyway, today. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 14, or you can just follow along with me as I'll be reading from there in a few minutes. John chapter 14 is a passage I have preached from many, many times, usually the first few verses out of that chapter. It's a passage I've used on many, many occasions at memorial services, but rarely do I get past verse 7 or 8. Today we're going to do our best to get a quick look at almost the entire chapter, and I already know now, guys, we'll be late getting out of here. <laughs> They've warned the teachers over there already, so it won't be extremely late, but it will be slightly late. Um... Did you guys ever play board games growing up? All right, I'm going to highlight three board games real quick just to kind of remind us of our past. Uh, how many of you remember the little board game? Now, now, oh, okay, Faith, you're sitting here close, so I get to pick on you because Akira's not here yet this morning. So, all right, did you ever play the board game Shoots and Ladders? Oh, good, all right. How many of you played Shoots and Ladders? Now, you all know that was not the original name, right? The original, see, this game came from India. And it was it originally was called Snakes and Ladders. There's, there, there's the game. All right. See where all the shoots are? Those used to be snakes on the original game board. All right. But, but 
but the game people knew how much that Americans hate snakes. <laughs> and so they changed it to shoots and ladders, all right? And the rules are pretty simple. You spin a spinner or you roll the dice, all right? Uh, the spinner was the Baptist version. <laughs> yeah, because Baptists didn't roll dice, all right? So the, the spinner was the, the Baptist version. And uh, once you spun or rolled your piece, you got to, uh, your, your dice or your spinner, you got to move your piece the number of spaces. And if you land on a ladder, your piece climbs up the ladder and advances several steps in progression. If you land on a chute or a snake, then your piece slides down and you lose several places. And the goal is to get to the end first. Uh, how many of you ever played the game Goose's Wild? Did you ever play that one? Probably less popular, but, but it, was, it was big in the mid-1960s called Goose's Wild. To win this game, a piece must land exactly on space number 63. If a player throws a number on the die that's too high, the piece counts the extra points backwards from the winning space. If you land on a goose space, you must continue backwards by that amount. I don't know about you, but that's not the way goosing works. It usually made me jump forward. <laughs> but, but in this game, you, you jump backward if, if you got goosed, all right? But then this last game, I'm confident probably close to 100% of you have played at some time or another. Are you ready? How about Candyland? Guys, you remember, huh? Everybody play Candyland? All right. Um, uh, actually, I just saw on, on Google as I was looking up all these games, making sure I remembered them correctly. Uh, I understand the um, ooh, L.A., they have a TV program, Sisters. Um, um, I shouldn't say that. Uh, the Kardashians, yeah. The, they, they just did a birthday party for one of their daughters in the Candyland theme. I'm not sure why I mentioned the Kardashians in church. <laughs> Other than the fact that I think they probably need to go to church. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but Candyland, is, it's, it's, a simple, it's a simple board game that's published by Hasbro. And the game requires no reading and minimal counting skills. It's suitable for me to play. Uh, and due to the design of the game, there's not much strategy involved. Players are never required to make choices. They are only to follow directions. These are the kind of games where the goal is to get to the finish line. Sounds an awful lot like life, doesn't it? We want to get to the finish line, but sometimes there are things that allow us to move faster and there are things that allow us to go backwards. The Gospel of John chapter 14 is a chapter in the Bible that's outlined in similar fashion to Shoots and Ladders, Gooses Wild, and Candyland. Jesus opens this chapter with troubled hearts. And he ends up in verse 27 with peace. Like a board game, we often can get sent back to the beginning. Like Shoots and Ladders. If you don't want to get set back, then you don't have to play the game. But if you don't play the game, you won't get to the finish line either. I suggest to you there are a lot of folks who go by the name of Christian that choose to stop playing the game. They only experience peace when there's an absence of conflict. And often they have very little conflict in their lives because they're wasting their lives in isolation and aloneness. When John chapter 14 begins, the apostles, the disciples, they're with Jesus in an upper room. They're hanging out kind of quietly together. There's some tension in the air, and the disciples are unsure of what's up, but Jesus seems to be very clear about what's about to happen. You see, Jesus knows that his time has come. Jesus knows that before that night is over, he'll be betrayed. He'll be arrested, he'll be beaten, and in less than 24 hours, he'll be nailed to a cross. Jesus knows all about that in the next few days. He knows his disciples are going to be on the fringes of all of this. One of them will be right in the middle of the betrayal. All of them will end up betraying in some form or fashion. 
All of them will witness the abuse that Jesus takes and all of them will see his death. And listen to what Jesus says to them in verses 1 through 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. If you trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if this wasn't so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come back and take you to where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. We're going to take a few stops along the way, and we're going to see how we can progress in our journey from troubled hearts to peaceful lives as we look at this passage Billy Graham, many years ago, put together a small booklet called Steps to Peace with God, and it's very similar to what we're going to talk about today. But finding peace in our lives is of critical importance to us, particularly here in America. Several years ago, the University of Duke, or Duke University, did a study on finding peace of mind. They investigated what are the factors that contribute greatly to emotional and mental stability. That They gave us about seven or eight. Let me highlight them very quickly for you. Remember, this is a university study. This is not a church commission study. It's not a Bible college. It's not a pastor study. This was done by Duke University. Listen to the observations they made. They said critical to emotional and mental stability is the absence of suspicion and resentment. Nursing a grudge was a major factor in unhappiness. Any of you holding a grudge against me? You're going to be very, very unhappy. Are you holding a grudge against anyone? Even God? Number two, Duke University said, not living in the past An an unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures leads to depression. Jesus says, I'll forgive all of your past, and there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Duke went on to say, not wasting time and energy fighting conditions you cannot change. Cooperate with life instead of trying to run from it. Number four, force yourself to stay involved with the living world. Resist the temptation to withdraw and become reclusive during periods of emotional stress. This is where small groups are really, really helpful. You may not like feeling out like coming to a big crowd on a Sunday morning, but man, plug into a small group, and when things get really tough, plug in, share, talk, admit, confess. Refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. Accept the fact that nobody gets through life without some sorrow and misfortune. Jesus said in John 14 and then again in John 16, and don't let your hearts be troubled for in this world you will have trouble. We can't avoid it. We should be ready for it. He goes on, they go on to say, cultivate the old-fashioned virtues. I find that fascinating. A Duke University study says, cultivate old-fashioned values. Well, what are those values? Love, humor. What's been our theme up until last week, and we'll get back to it soon, is joy and humor, joy and laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. Compassion and loyalty. Next, do not expect too much of yourself. When there is too wide a gap between self-expectation and your ability, ability to meet the goals you've set, feelings of inadequacy are inevitable. This is, man, in this day of self esteem, here is a challenge. Don't think of yourself too highly. The Bible says, don't think of yourself more than you ought. The Bible says that in you and I, Apart from a relationship with the Lord Jesus, no good thing dwells amongst us. And yet it goes on to say, but when Christ is in you, you now have the hope of glory. All that Christ is for everything that you and I need as we face the challenges of life. The last thing this study said is find something bigger than yourself to believe in. A university. Find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Who's bigger than God? Self-centered, egotistical people score lowest in any test for measuring personal happiness. So what are the steps to peace? Number one, a sense of long-time security. 
If we know that the long term is secure, we are better prepared for the surprises of today. So here's the example. Uh, we've got an accountant or two in this building. We had one in the 8 o'clock service. He confirmed that what I was, had said was true. Accountants will tell us that in our personal finances, we ought to have three to six months of our salary put away in a savings account just in case there's a surprise. And some of you are laughing and say, that's never happened. Wouldn't you feel more secure if it was? If you have three to six months, then if somebody says, hey, we've got to do cutbacks here and we're going to cut your salary, you're not going to be so stunned. If somebody actually comes in and says, we have cutbacks, you're losing your job. There's no panic because why? We have resources for long term that are out there. The same thing is true in life. If we know we have a home in heaven and eternity is guaranteed for us, then as we face the challenges of life, even when the grim reaper comes calling, it's not as terrifying as it would be because we have long-term security. Jesus reveals two areas that should make us feel more secure in our daily life. Number one, Jesus said, I'm building an addition to my Father's house for you. What, what was Jesus' occupation when he was on earth, what's he still doing in eternity? He's still a carpenter. He is still preparing a room for you and for me in the Father's house. And the second thing he says is, one day I'll return for you as a groom does his bride. You see, in this analogy that Jesus is using, I go to prepare a place for you. Us Westerners didn't fully get it, all right, when we read it. We have to understand the culture in the East in which Jesus was drawing from when he wrote this. This is an explanation of the first century Jewish wedding procedure. The terminology clearly refers to the customs of that day. You see, in first century, marriages were arranged between parents with the permission of the prospective bride. The bride had to agree to it. If a marriage was arranged and the couple was officially betrothed, engaged, the man would soon leave for his father's house, even though maybe he'd been an adult already for a few years and had a place of his own. When he got married, he returned to the father's house and he built an addition to it. Over the next year, he would build this addition attached to the father's house for he and his bride to live in. The bride and her attendants... Are you ready for this? This is where the parable of the ten virgins comes in. Okay? So, being a virgin in those days was very, very important. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's unimportant today. All right? Still think it's a good deal. But see, the, the, the bride and her attendants never knew exactly when the groom would arrive to sweep up his bride and take her to the wedding feast, which would be held at his father's house perhaps even a different town than where the bride lived in. Since they did not know the day nor the exact hour the groom would come, the bride had to be ready. The groomsmen would precede the groom to where the bride was living and make the announcements to the bride and, and, and the bridal party. And they would say, Behold, the groom is coming. I think I'm going to, at the next wedding I do, I think I'm going to stand up and say, Behold, John Reelhorn, the groom, is coming. It's next on my list, all right? I just think that'd be a great announcement. And soon the groom would then arrive after that announcement, whisk his bride away to the wedding feast. And during the feast, are you ready for this, guys? During the feast, the groom would take his bride to the annex he had just built. And during the feast, he would consummate the marriage. Folks, y'all go ahead and party, but we've got business to attend to, okay? You can see how this imagery is used in this passage, John 14. Jesus is described to us in multiple places in the Bible as the groom. And you and I, who become by faith part of his church, we are the bride. And he leaves for an indefinite period of time, coming to surprise his bride one day, so she had better be ready. He's busy preparing a place for us. Now, it's not really a mansion, though I grew up singing all kinds of songs in church about a mansion. It's going to be far better than a mansion. Don't let this ruin your idea of heaven. Read Revelation 22. A mansion is going to be kid stuff compared to what heaven's going to be like. We will not be disappointed. It will be far grand, more grand than even Disneyland. The return of which Jesus speaks about in this passage is our death 
when he calls us home, or it's an event in the future when Christ will come back for all of us. An event that the Bible describes that those who are dead in Christ, in other words, their bodies are buried. We've already gone to be with God by our spirit, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but at some date in the future, the scripture says our bodies will rise, and those who were alive at the time that the groom shows up, we will all be caught up in the heavens to be with the Lord. And then we will share in this incredible marriage celebration. You you get the picture of what Jesus is talking about here? What a celebration. Do you have have that kind of long-term security? That when you face the challenges of today, they don't devastate you? In in the next few verses, verses 5 through 7, Jesus just got through saying, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas speaks up and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. (laughs) Don't you love it as parents when you tell your kids something and they say, I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus said, I'll tell you, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. And from now on, you you would know him and you will have seen him. There's some very simple beliefs here, but they can be somewhat offensive to folks. Three simple truths. How can I be saved? How can I be sure? And how can I be satisfied? And Jesus says, the way to be saved is me. I'm the only way. That's what's offensive to folks. Folks want to think I can get there through Buddha. I can get there uh, through some other religion. I get, you can't get to God through any religion. You can get to God through Jesus Christ. It's not about being Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or Catholic. It is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. People say, Tim, that's kind of narrow. There's got to be. I tell you what, find somebody else who had over 400 prophecies written about him thousands of years before he was born. And in his life, he fulfilled every one of those prophecies. And the most important one that he fulfilled was on the third day after his death and burial, he raised himself from the dead. And 2,000 years later, the world can't get over him. 2,000 years later, thousands and millions of people every year are giving their life to this risen Savior. If you can find somebody else who's had that kind of impact on the world, then maybe you can follow them. But I've looked for another person who comes close in comparison, and I can't find him. How can I be saved? Jesus says, I am the way. How can I be sure? Jesus said, I am the truth. We can be sure when there is a stable truth. And Jesus did not change yesterday, today, or tomorrow. He is the way. He's the way to the truth. And when he is the way and he's the way to the truth, he's the truth about how I can be satisfied. He said, I am the life. He is the only one raised from the dead with the purpose of coming to live within you and live within me in the person of the Holy Spirit in our life. We then should become active. It's what these next verses 8 through 14 talk about. Active in the work that Christ has for us. The scripture says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and will be enough for us. And Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip, even after having been among you so long? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. This is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, future verses, God the Holy Spirit. We are one. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me and the words I say to you are not just my own? Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so the Father may be glory, so the Son may be glory to the Father. You may ask anything and I will do it. What is the works that Jesus is talking about here? Is he talking about miracles like giving sight to blind people? Is he talking about healing lame people so that they can walk again? Is he talking about raising the dead? No. If you want to know what Jesus was talking about, and I don't have time to turn to all of them today, but write these down. Luke 19.10 Matthew 18, 11, Matthew 28, 19, the works that Jesus is talking about as he said, I came to seek and to save those who were lost. 
That was the purpose of the coming of Christ, was to seek and to save those who had no relationship with God the Father. Now, he did some miracles to prove to those that he was who he said he was, doing what he came that he said he was going to accomplish. The context of these verses is the work Many Christians today have little peace because they're more concerned with the benefits and rewards of their own job than they are the kingdom work of sharing the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Verses 15 through 21 talk about the appreciation of God's presence in our life by the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in the midst of these verses, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will send another comforter. That's the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to come live within our human spirit. You can read Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 that talks about that. The presence of Christ in us is to bring us encouragement, consolation, to challenge us, to exhort us. When the Holy Spirit is active, we love Jesus The measuring stick of our love for the Savior really is our obedience. In the 8 o'clock service, there are three or four people that I grew up with from childhood. And I asked them to let the rest of the audience know that I was telling the truth. I was not a very rebellious teenager. Now, when I say that, I'm not telling you I was perfect. And I'm not telling you I wasn't rebellious. I got drunk as a teenager. One time. One time. It was such a miserable experience, I never wanted to do it again. I couldn't walk straight. I couldn't shoot a basketball the next morning. It was horrible. I swore I'd never, ever do that again, and and I haven't. But the reason my period of rebellion was so short is not because I was a fantastic Christian and well-discipled at 16, 17, 18 years of age. And I didn't figure this out till I was in my early 30s. The reason my rebellion was short was because I knew how much my parents loved me. And I knew how much I loved my parents. And I saw the kind of pain that other kids caused in the heart of their parents. And I didn't want to do that. It was that important to me. And if that is true about my earthly parents, ought not to even be more true about the love of my heavenly father. He loves me far more than my mom or dad ever possibly could. And so loving him should make it easy to trust and obey him. We are in the Holy Spirit's adoptive care. Romans 8, 15, he tells us that we are the adopted sons and daughters by the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. And that Holy Spirit comes to live within us when we, one, confess we have a need for God because of rebellion in our own life. It's called sin. Number two, when we confess that to the Lord Jesus and invite him to come live within our life at that moment, not based upon a feeling, but based upon the truth. You see, I was born in Blythe, California. You know what that entitles me to be? First off, a desert rat. But more importantly, a citizen of the United States. I didn't feel one thing about being a citizen, but it was true the day I was born. The moment that I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that Christ, that God raised Christ from the dead, at that moment, I become a child of God. I don't have to feel it, though sometimes I do, but I have to believe it. I have to know it. And that is what God said is true for us. Let me wrap this up as quickly as I can. What is this peace that Jesus talks about in verse 27. He said, peace I will give to you. Peace unlike the world can offer, I will leave with you. Shalom is the word for peace here. It's a precious word. It means 
much more than the absence of distress. Shalom means wholeness, completeness, health, prosperity in the best sense. And the word bases its peace on resources, while God's peace depends upon relationships. People in the world walk by sight and depend on externals. But as Christians, we are to walk by faith and we depend upon eternals. The peace of God is not the absence of chaos, but it is the presence of Christ in the midst of the chaos. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of troubles or death, Christ is with me and I do not have to be afraid. Several years ago, a submarine was being tested, and it had to remain submerged for many hours. When it returned to the harbor the next afternoon, the captain was asked, how did this terrible terrible storm affect you all last night? The officer looked at the man in surprise, and he said, storm? What storm? We didn't know there even was one. You see, the submarine had been so far beneath the surface that it had reached that known area to sailors as the cushion of the sea. Although the ocean may be whipped into huge waves by high winds, the waters below are never stirred. And I believe this is a perfect picture of the peace of Christ when the waves of worry and fear and heartbreak cannot touch those who are at peace with God and with themselves and with others. Let me wrap this up. Bruce Larson tells how he helped people struggling to surrender their lives with Christ. Bruce Larson was a counselor in New York City, the heart of the city. And for many years, he said, I worked in New York City and I counseled at my office and any number of people who were wrestling with the yes or no decision of inviting Christ in their life. He said, often I would suggest that they walk with me from my office down to the RCA building on Fifth Avenue In the entrance of that building is a gigantic statue of Atlas and a beautifully proportioned man That's not me. I need Stephen up here right now, all right? This beautifully proportioned man with a gigantic world on his shoulders. His muscles are straining and it's weighting him down. And there he is, the most powerfully built man in the world and he can barely stand under this burden. Now, that's the way you could live. You can try to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders But let's go across the street. And on the other side of Fifth Avenue is St. Patrick's Cathedral. Shelley and I were there two years ago. And there behind the high altar is a little shrine of the boy Jesus, perhaps eight or nine years old. And with no effort, he is holding the same size world in one hand. He graphically illustrated his point. He said, we have a choice. We can carry the world on our own shoulders and it will weight us down. Or we can say, I give up, Lord. Here's my life. I give you my world, my whole world. And he carries us with ease in the palm of his hand. So you have a choice today. If you're already a Christian, you have a choice to trust God with your whole heart and all of the current circumstances going on in your world. If you're not a believer and it's the reason you're not a believer is not because you're worse than anybody else in this room. It's just you haven't made the choice to invite Jesus into your life. You can stop trying to be Atlas and you can surrender and be a Christian. So why don't we pause to pray? And whichever choice you need to make today Why don't you make it in the quietness of your heart while I pray? No magic formula, no special words. Just an honest confession that says, God, I've been a Christian for years, but I've been a Christian on my terms, not yours. I'm ready to surrender it all. And maybe you're here and you've you've been religious, or maybe you've been very irreligious, but you're ready to say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all. Our Father in heaven, You know what brought us together today, this particular group of folks. You know why you worked this sermon into the fabric of of my brain and my heart. And we've come together today, Father, not to hear me preach a sermon, but we've come today to hear you speak to each of our hearts. 
And thank you, Father, that when you speak and we respond, you hear our voice, our prayer of confession, our prayer of belief, our prayer that's in need of forgiveness, and our prayer that enable us to become no longer orphans in this world, but your children with long-term security. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't get up yet. <laughs> we've, um, we've looked at a few stops along the way to help us in our onward journey towards peace. As a church and as individuals, we have some other options out there, and I want to briefly share those. If you have been through a recent loss in your life, the death of a family member or a friend, we do have an outreach ministry in our church called Grief Share. It's been here for, for probably close to 20 years. It's led by wonderful people, different folks throughout the years. It's, uh, it offers really about three times a year. Right now they're on a short two-month break and say, oh, no, I missed it. No, you didn't. In fact, the directives that come out of Grief Share themselves says it's best, it's best for you to wait two to three months after the immediate loss of someone important to you before you take Grief Share because often you are too, too numb so close. And so if you've experienced a loss and it still is weighing you down, it's still a struggle for you, I would, I would strongly encourage you, fill out one of the cards in the pew next week. Take one today and hand it to an usher when you leave. Put your name and contact information and check Grief Share. And the leaders of Grief Share will follow up with you and let you know the starting dates in August. If your grief is not recent, but it's old, but it's still a struggle for you, there's not a time period on the other end of when you shouldn't take it. We've had people take Grief Share where that loss was 30 and 40 years ago. And they have told us time and time again the difference that this small group, Bible study support group, has meant to them. Some have taken the class three times because it's of been great help. The second thing is there's an organization in town that I highly recommend. Normally when I talk about them, it's, it's, it's connected to hospice care. But Heinz Hospice has, has two outreaches as well as their hospice care. They have a suicide prevention. If this is an issue that is troubling for you, then call Heinz Hospice Suicide Prevention. They have resources and people that will be happy to talk to you. They also have a support group called Survivors of Suicide. If it is something that you have attempted in the past, we're glad you failed. And there's a resource available to you. If, if it has happened to someone in your family, you are the survivor of that suicide, they have a support group for you. And again, I strongly support Heinz Hospice in those two areas. The third area is closer to home. Over the next several weeks, we'll be setting some dates and scheduling some evening events to have roundtable discussions. We want to be a church that is an environment where folks can say to someone, I'm struggling with this problem, no matter what that problem is, suicide included. We want to remove the stigma. We want to remove a barrier. And so, if you have survived suicide, if you are part of a family that has been through it, um, if you are looking for answers, if you have some answers, and you'd like to be part of some roundtable discussions, besides pastors present, we're going to have some mental health uh, folks available as well that can help us walk through and talk about how we can be better equipped to live up to the name that we have on our sign, which is New Hope. And if you'd like to be part of that, then again, take one of those cards, call the office, email me, and say, hey, I'd like to be notified when those times are set. I would like to be a part of that. So those are just some things that you can do immediately that can help in this particular area. God bless you. Go have a great day with your dads. Go have a great day remembering your dads. Enjoy family and friendship time. God bless you.